Hey everyone. Before we get into today's story, I wanted to talk to you about today's sponsor, Hunt a Killer, or more specifically, and very intriguingly, their brand new series that takes place in the Blair Witch universe. If you're like me, you've been staying indoors the past few centuries. But that's alright, because Hunt a Killer ships their Blair Witch game box straight to your door. Now you have the chance to put yourself right smack dab in the middle of a horror movie scenario. The basic synopsis is this. A woman, Rosemary Kent, has a son that's gone missing, and she's turned to you for help. Do you think you can wade through the documents and evidence to investigate the Black Hills Forest and find her missing son? Instead of the usual murder mystery box, this is a genuine story that takes place in the Blair Witch Cinematic Universe. I've tried my hand at various horror board games in the past, but this is out of this world. You're literally put in the position of being the detective, discovering audio recordings and working through very unnerving puzzles. And you'll enjoy this regardless if you're a fan of the Blair Witch movies. The box I received far exceeded my high expectations, both in terms of quality and all-around enjoyment. As far as being put into the middle of a horror story or show is concerned, this feels about as close as I could ever want. Right now, you can head on over to huntakiller.com slash clancy and use code clancy for 20% off your first box. Again, you can use my code clancy for 20% off. Now, with all that out of the way, I hope you enjoy tonight's episode. Please don't open unexpected packages. Written and narrated by Clancy Pasta. Snow, freezing rain, and more snow. That's what I've had to look forward to every morning the past few days, guessing whether or not the front sidewalk would be covered in white powder or a glaze of ice when I looked out of my bedroom window. It wasn't exciting, but I was always curious. It had been going hard here. The winter storms going on here and across the states have caused quite a lot of damage. Don't need me to tell you that. Luckily, the worst I've had to deal with is spotty internet, though the fact that the worst of the storm hit after my grandpa left for a business trip, taking the only car in the household with him was arguably the worst part of it all. He's gotten stuck somewhere in Kansas, cooped up in some hotel room, and I haven't even been able to hear from him in a few days now. It's worrying, to say the least, but all I could do is wait. So now, I'm here. A 24-year-old college dropout living at my grandpa's house, stranded at home in the middle of the worst snowstorm in decades. At least there's a pantry full of canned soup and saltines. For that, I think I'll be thankful till the day I die. Because of all of the insanity and destruction induced by the storm, the mail has been heavily affected. Haven't received so much as a piece of junk mail in over a week, typically at least a bi-weekly occurrence. And that's why, upon waking one morning and looking out the window to see what flavor of frigid hell I'd find, I was shocked to see a package sitting right at the end of the driveway. It looked like a square cardboard box with some label on the top. Pretty average, I suppose. I wasn't expecting any packages. But then again, my grandpa's usually the one who does the vast majority of the ordering and mail checking, but he hasn't been here to deal with that. It's probably just something he ordered. I slid on the only winter coat I had, a blue and black striped number I'd had since my mid-teens, and scurried out the door. I was smart enough to throw on a beanie, but dead-brained enough to slip my sandals on over my socks. Yeah, not the smartest move, but... I was only running out to grab the package. When I got close enough to snag the package, I was shocked with the weight of the thing. I figured it could be a little on the heavier side, given the size. It appeared to be about a foot long each way, and I had no idea what my grandpa had ordered. But when I pressed my hand against each side and attempted to lift it up, it didn't budge. 
I thought perhaps we had gotten another bout of freezing rain which had practically super glued it to the pavement. But when I wedged both hands under one side and lifted, I was able to tilt the side about an inch off the ground using a decent amount of strength. No, this thing wasn't frozen to the ground. It was just heavy as all hell. My quick 30 second round trip to the end of the driveway ended up turning into a 5 minute drag, slide, lift, drop, and repeat all the way to the front door. With a final grunt, I tipped the box over and into the front door, using the bottom of my sandaled foot to shove it the remainder of the way in so I could close it. Once inside, with the doors closed and the deadbolt locked, I quickly kicked my sandals off and collapsed onto the couch not more than six feet from the door. I huffed and tried to catch my breath, but I hadn't gotten a workout like that in many months, and I'm not sure I've ever worked that hard below freezing. And yes, I am sedentary as hell, and I know simply dragging a package indoors from the snow isn't typically something that would warrant an all-out collapse upon cessation, but given my lifestyle as of late, that's what I'm dealing with. After a few minutes of rest, I realized I never checked the package's label. The moment this realization hit me, I knew I was going to want to jump off a cliff if the address was anything but my own. But, luckily, the address was mine. But that didn't stop my eyes from straining and the butterflies from gracing my stomach. The name above the address was not my grandfather's, and it also wasn't the name anyone knows me by. I suppose I should explain that anyone who's ever met me knows me as Ty, obviously short for Tyler. But even that is slightly misleading, as Tyler is actually my middle name. Anyways, the name on the box was my full legal name, first, middle, and last. I tried to think of when the last time I'd gotten a letter with my full legal name on it was, as typically even official correspondence used my full middle at the very most. And as my eyes scanned the rest of the package, I couldn't find a return address or any postage whatsoever. The box had my full attention now. Now inside where it was warm and I could take my time on the flat hardwood flooring, I slid the box over to the side of the coffee table in front of the couch with one long yet slow hunched shove. To be honest, it was more of a crawl. I waited a moment, and then started finding places to grab at on the package. It ended up taking me a few tries, but I did get the package onto the table, not without taking all of the breath from my lungs though, and I decided to grab a cola from the fridge and relax for a few minutes. What the hell could possibly be in that box? The time had finally come, and I grabbed my keys from right beside the box. I cut through the box tape on the top and perimeter sides with the blunt key. Then, as you may have been able to guess, I opened it. Inside I saw nothing, literally nothing, just shadows and darkness. I took a deep breath in and got up, walking to the side and examining it from other angles. Nope. All just the inside walls of the cardboard box descending into thick shadows. The bottom was not visible. Grabbing for my phone, I turned on the flashlight. I aimed it over and straight into the box, and that's when the box took my breath for a second or possibly third time. The flashlight illuminated deep into the box, just as would be expected but with absolutely no end in sight. Three, four feet into a box that was positively no more than a foot deep to begin with, and yet the bottom was nowhere to be seen. Though it lit up well, the darkness ate up the light's radiance. If anyone were home to see me at this moment in time, I believe they would have thought they'd stumbled upon a statue, because that's what I was at that moment. 
I was frozen to the ground, staring with an abject look of stunned curiosity deep into the box. Though, to be fair, my eyes were jumping around from side to side, to darkness to side, in a panicked frenzy. And as I stared into the abyss, panicked yet mostly devoid of notable thought, as I truly couldn't process what exactly was going on to begin with, something interesting popped into my mind, and it was a series of images. Images of me rolling up the sleeve on my right arm and reaching down with all my flexibility into the box. Would that be crazy? To shove my arm into a box currently breaking the laws of physics? Could anything happen that would mutilate me, rip off my arm, leaving me gored for my grandpa to find in a pool of my own blood next to a perfectly normal package? These were genuine questions in my mind, but for some reason the curiosity prevailed. Perhaps it's because of the ridiculousness of the situation at hand to begin with. If this box's existence at all was possible, then anything was possible. And at least 50% of everything isn't bad. I didn't roll up my sleeve, but I did, on the count of three, slowly reach into the box. The first thing I noticed was the change in temperature. Despite the heater blasting heat into the room at a toasty 79 degrees, upon entering the box's domain, I was met with a noticeable drop into the 50s or 40s, and it would only get colder the deeper I went. I waited slowly at first, but weighed I did deeper and deeper, until my neck was about six inches from the upper edge of the box, leaned over on my side as far as I could go. I reached around, feeling nothing but the cardboard sides. I decided that if I was willing to go this far, I might as well do it right. I descended further, eventually pressing my neck and curving my torso as hard as I could to get as deep as I could into the box. And, as I did so, my blind hand finally found something new. My neck about two inches away from the side, my fingertips discovered what felt like water, or at least some kind of liquid. And then, nearly the moment my neck hit the side and my flexibility had been pushed to the limit, my middle fingertip just barely found and wrapped around with the most delicate curl, a small hook or the underside of a handle, or something. When I knew I had reached as far as I could, I very gently began to lift whatever it was that I had stumbled across up. There was a slight give to it, as though it had been trapped in some already disturbed sand, but I was able to pull it up without much trouble at all. And as I pulled my arm out of the darkness, and sat up and scooted over to the couch once again, I examined what I had found. It was what appeared to be a small little metal tag, kind of like one of those bracelets that has a half an inch to one inch piece of rectangular metal with a phrase or a name engraved into it, or something you'd find on a dog collar. On the right side was this fairly large and decently long metal swoop, forming the convenient hook my finger found and the other side of the rectangle swooped down into two thin spines, apparently to hold it in place wherever I had taken it from. And yes, there was indeed something engraved into the steel, and I read it over and over and over again. I read out loud, Do you have a wish? That's what was engraved on the metal. I flipped it around to find a blank, perfectly smooth back, then flipped it back over. What the hell did that mean? Do I have a wish? Well, I mean, of course I have wants and desires and dreams, but that question could refer to just about anything, I believe, depending on the context. After a while of changing positions on the couch, studying and reading that phrase over and over again, 
I muttered to myself, something along the lines of, I wish I knew what the hell this thing meant. And it was at that very moment, the box collapsed in on itself. It was so strange. One moment, I'm sitting there, the next I mutter that phrase, and the very next, my attention is jerked to the box on my coffee table, collapsing, almost like folding in on itself, in a violent, off-rhythm, strange way. Even stranger than it had to be, given the bizarre nature of it all to begin with, I should say. After, what, probably a second at the absolute most, the box completely disappeared altogether. It was like one moment there was a little speck of brown where it had once been on the table. And then, it was gone. Poof. It's like it was never even there. But, of course, that lasted but a second on its own. Just a moment later, from the place where the box once was, came a brilliant explosion. A blast of air, blaring sound, flashing colors, and smoke. And out of the smoke arose and grew this ever-expansive, winding, completely fantastical box that snaked around itself growing and stretching into the air, and then swooping back down in a fanciful curl with what should have been the top of the box, coming to lay on its side and slightly skewed to face me, right beside the bottom of the box. What once was a cardboard package in equal dimensions, roughly one by one, it had easily transformed into some strange, completely impractical monstrosity with dimensions easily in the range of something like 25 or 30 to 1. And just as quickly as the sound and the string of flashing colors, the blast of air, and the length of the box had appeared, everything ceased. It was as quiet as it had ever been. There was no draft in the room, but that extremely strange box was still there. My heart was pounding, and my throat felt dry and irritated, like I had just been screaming. I'm still not sure if I was. Again, just another moment later, and I heard for the very first time, if you don't count the inscription on the piece of metal, the voice of the box. And it said, You wish to understand the meaning of this treasure. The meaning is this. To fulfill two desires of anyone who stumbles upon this highly sought after and rare crate. This is the fulfillment of your first. The universe is a master, and I am its cattle. The end of the box's words sent a shiver up my spine. What the hell did that mean? And if the meaning of the box was to fulfill the desires of whoever stumbled upon it, why the hell did I not stumble upon it? It was addressed to me and placed on my driveway. I didn't stumble upon shit. Barely able to believe what was happening, yet being fully immersed in my new reality, I shook my head. And after a while of hesitation, I spoke. But, I didn't find this. This, or you, were sent to me in the mail, I guess. Why was this addressed to me? And just, why are you here? The few moments pause that stood from the end of my questioning to the beginning of its response was highly unnerving. Is that a wish? It asked. Damn it, I thought. I guess all this thing would respond to was a wish. And I've already asked my first wish, I sheepishly asked. Much quicker than last time, it responded, correct. I slumped back into the couch and ran my fingers through my hair. I could barely believe what was happening. But once again, at the same time, I was fully immersed in it. 
looking back I could have, and probably should have, not taken it up on its offer. I should have just removed the box from the house and went on with my life. Though given the bizarre and illogical state of the box, I'm sure disposing of it would have been quite the task. I thought long and hard. I'm not sure exactly how long. But by the time I was ready to make my move, I noticed the sun just beginning to set outside the living room window. I took a few deep breaths. Then, I made my wish. I wish for two more wishes, I spoke. If I wasn't losing my mind, and this was all truly taking place in the real world, I needed to make the most of it. And counting the muttered question of myself as my first wish was the opposite of fair to begin with. Silence hung in the air followed by what sounded like a low hum, and the room vibrated ever so slightly. Your wish is for two more wishes. This cannot be done. Make another wish. Now, I don't know what possessed me to act in the way I did in that moment. Perhaps I was just giddy with the impossibility of the situation I was thrusted into, but in a flash of a moment, I decided to argue with this thing. I told it how it wasn't fair to count that first thing as a wish and that I deserved two genuine wishes. It never said a word during my entire diatribe, but eventually I petered out and sat in silence, awaiting its response. Again an unnervingly long pause, but a response did come. You may be granted two more wishes, but only under the laws of Yaldabaoth. Your second wish has been granted. Now make your third and fourth. May the master's enforcer have mercy on this transaction. I must confess, I had no idea what any of that meant, but I understood the first part. I was indeed granted two more wishes, and I already had the first and most important lined up in my mind. I wasted no time in responding. I wish to be the wealthiest man on earth. And as the words left my mouth, I was actually a bit surprised. I had the idea to ask for wealth, extreme wealth, of course, but I didn't have the phrasing ahead of time. I didn't plan on wishing to be the wealthiest, but at the same time, I sure as hell didn't have any regrets about it. Surprisingly, the voice whispered back, Are you sure? I raised an eyebrow and calmly responded, Uh, yes, I am sure. And after yet another painfully long pause, the box began to shake, and then it began to recede, trailing back in reverse, winding back up to the ceiling, and then shortening itself back into the shape of a normal box. And as it did so, the now trembling voice boomed, May the enforcer have great mercy on this transaction. Before the box, just as before, collapsed in on itself and imploded. I suppose I expected the box to pop back into existence with an explosion of energy as it had before, but just another moment later, something incredible happened. Or it would be much more accurate to say, something incredibly bizarre happened. One moment I was there, sitting on my couch, feeling the heater blasting warm air onto my face from the vent above the TV on mute in the background, the now barren table in front of me. And the very next thing I knew, I was surrounded by pure, unadulterated darkness. And not only that, the heat had been replaced by bitter, barren cold. So cold 
my first instinct was to believe I had somehow passed out and slept walked outside into the snow. But I felt no snow against my skin, though I found myself laying on something, and that something was definitely not a couch. It felt like rough, solid rock, or rather an enormous mix of rocks of various sizes. But again, I could see nothing. Immediately, the cold took my breath away, and I reacted by retreating to the fetal position. It was at this moment I made my next discovery. I was completely naked. Every inch of clothing I had on was nowhere to be felt. Just the frigid rocks against my side and back, freezing against the side of my thighs. What the... I whispered to myself, and attempted to look all around to find some source of light, but there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Hello? I shouted out. Is anybody there? Is anything there? Where the hell am I? I received no response. Giving up almost immediately, I curled my neck back down to try to conserve warmth. I tried to listen closely, but not even the sound of the wind graced my eardrums. After what felt like minutes, that now familiar voice called out in the distance. You have one more wish. I immediately shouted back. Where the hell am I? What the hell is going on right now? And unsurprisingly, after its usual pause, it responded, Is that a wish? I sighed, but in my stunned state, feeling like I was moments away from freezing to death, I called out in reaction, Yes, yes, I wish to know where I am and what the hell's going on. I felt a heavy vibration in the rocks, followed by a low, but audible grumble. It then responded, That is two wishes, not one. But y'all to buy oath has allowed it. And then went on to explain. You are now the wealthiest man on earth. Under the rules of y'all to buy oath, the enforcer scoured the multiverse in search of a reality that fit your sacred wish under the traditional rules. This process would take place in your own universe, but once you wished for more wishes, this process was transferred to the domain of the Enforcer. An alternate universe was located to fit your desire, and you have been brought here. Your wish has been fulfilled. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. What the hell are you talking about? I'm not rich here, I don't even have fucking clothes. Take me back, I want to go back right now. This bitter cold against my bare skin was becoming more unbearable by the second. I knew the pattern, and I knew that more or less, the voice did not respond unless it was to a wish. But I guess knowing that the wishes were now over, that they had been spent, he decided to throw me a bone. The voice replied, In this universe, at this age, the sun has already expired, and the earth was one of the lucky planets. Instead of being destroyed in the magnificent star's end, it was shot off in a single direction with a gravitational swing. This earth, your domain is now a rogue planet. The only thing keeping the temperature from plunging into the deep negatives of deep space is from the heat of the inner core, but that too will subside eventually. This planet hasn't seen a speck of life in more than 20,000 years. You are not only the only human on this planet, but the only hint of life here. But regardless of the details, 
You currently have more wealth than anything else here. This is now your domain. You are now king. Your wish has been fulfilled. The words bounced around my skull like razor blades in a barrel. How could this possibly be? If this was all true, how much time would I have left here? With no food, almost definitely no water, or at least no liquid water, and no light or shelter, I'd be dead within a day. And what would happen back at home? What would my grandpa think? Or, in some strange science fiction-esque way, am I still back there? On my couch, in my home, back on the proper earth. Was I literally transported here? Or was my consciousness somehow divided, and a part of me continues to live on back there, and another part, the part I currently embody, continues to carry on over here? Regardless, I knew it didn't matter. The voice's words had sunken in, and I understood them well. I tried to call out, to shriek, to scream for another reply, for another voice to help me, to reverse what had been done, to take me back and give me another chance, or just leave me alone and find another victim all together. But silence. The purest, most devilish silence I had ever been graced was all I received in return. Eventually, knowing I had no other choice and no way out, I lifted myself to my feet. Or, I should probably say, I tried to. As I took my first steps, the terrain was far too jagged, sharp, and painful to bear on the soles of my bare feet. I collapsed immediately and screamed in pain as my right hip cracked against a sharp rock. After a moment of recovery, I picked a direction and began to crawl. Everything was the same. The damned icy rocks, my only company here on my new home, my new planet, my new universe. I know these words will find no other ears. I know I'm currently in my own mind, thinking these thoughts. As I lay across the jagged rocks, eyes frozen over in a frostbitten glaze, my legs numb to the touch and my breath slower than I even knew possible. But it truly feels as though I'm communicating with someone or something right now. And if I am, please spread my message. And please, for the love of all things holy, do not take the opportunity to fulfill your true wish. Okay. Thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's original story. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe for more if you haven't already. It's been another little while since I had uh, written a story of my own, and uh, this one was definitely different for me. But uh, I enjoyed writing it, and I hope you guys uh, enjoyed listening to it. I'd love to hear what you thought about it. If you'd like to help support this channel, I'd appreciate it if you check out the Patreon link in the description. Follow me on Twitter at ClancyPasta, and I will see you all next time. Have a great night, everybody. Cheers.